Yeah. <clears throat> and then everyone says, that's a silly idea. That'll never happen. Now here we are in web, what is it, 3.0, 4.0? I can't even remember what it is. Yeah. Uh, and we now have groceries delivered to our doorstep, thanks to the folks at Instacart. Jeremy, yeah. welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Through a couple different talks, all linked together. The first one's going to be more about an overview of what data science is at Instacart and what we do on the logistics side. Uh, then I just published a blog post uh, yesterday around how we're using deep learning to sort shopping lists for our shoppers in the stores. So I'm not going to kind of bore you with all of the intricacies of deep learning models, but I'll take you through the intro of it so you have some understanding of that. And then you know, if we have time at the end, I have a talk that goes more into how you think about building teams in data science. So those are the topics we're going to cover. Feel free to ask me questions you know, at any point. Uh, we can make this very interactive. Before I start, maybe everybody raise your hand. Yeah. OK, now I know who's listening. So how, uh, lower your hand if you, if you don't buy groceries. OK. OK, so everybody buys groceries? That, that guy doesn't buy, oh, no, he buys groceries. OK, uh, lower your hand if you uh, have never heard of Instacart before today. It's OK. No judgment, no judgment. Lower your hand if you've never tried Instacart. OK, I need to fix this. So we've got three people that have tried it. Are any of you Express members? Oh, yes, we have an Express member. So my whole goal here is actually not to talk about data science, it's to convince you to try Instacart. Uh, OK. So uh, I'll do, tell you a little bit first about myself. So I've been at this for roughly 15 years. I started out with a math kind of PhD, all of the coursework for a PhD, and decided I would go into industry instead of actually finishing it. So the first thing I went and did was insurance. Uh, the insurance industry will hire anyone with a math background. As long as you tell them, you'll take the actuarial exams. And so that was how I got my first job. And I convinced them to let me do uh, neural networks and try to predict cancer mortality, and then ended up spending about four or five years doing consulting in insurance. One of my favorite projects was predicting the likelihood that a physician would be sued for medical malpractice. Uh, and so you can not only look at their you know, specialty and their, their educational background, you can look at their credit score, right? This guy is you know, drinking and smoking while, while doing surgery, maybe indicative of problems. Uh, you can look at their um, uh, prescription data, right? How many patients are they writing prescriptions for? How many surgeries are they doing? So tons of interesting data to look at. Uh, I then went and did an analytics stint uh, at EY, really partly strategy consulting and then building out their global analytics infrastructure and team, helping them make better business decisions about how to price audits or how to think about what new markets to enter, how to think about people and uh, promotions and kind of fair compensation. I went to ad tech where they had lots of data, really wanted to get deeper into technology, started out building the data science team there and ultimately was the CTO kind of leading a, a global organization, building real-time bidding uh, systems for infrastructure for advertising technology. Went to a software as a service business in, in uh, uh, New York doing personalization as a service. So uh, uh, a platform you can plug into an uh, e-commerce site or a publisher to make recommendations. And then recently have joined Instacart uh, doing grocery delivery. So for each one, I kind of show you the team size. Uh, this is actual data scientists. In some cases, I've managed you know, product and engineers in much larger organizations. So in many cases, starting from zero or starting from a few at Instacart, there were actually seven people when I joined, and we've doubled the size of that team. We want to double it again. Uh, Instacart has an organization in engineering, about 120 people. 35 are data-related. You know, five do data engineering. About 15 do what I call decision science or, or analytics at Instacart. And the other 15 do machine learning. I really focus on the folks doing the machine learning. So that's a little bit about me. So what is data science at Instacart? Well, there's a few different types of problems we have to solve. On the logistics side, there are these interesting challenges around how do we really predict what's going to happen in the future? There is a lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty. We have many different shoppers potentially doing many different orders at different locations, doing the driving and the delivery uh, legs of those. We need to predict how long is it going to take all of those people. And I'll kind of explain a little bit about how and why. We also have a really challenge prob challenging problem of optimally assigning the shoppers. So you've got thousands of orders to deliver. You have many hundreds of shoppers. And you need to come up with a plan over the next five hours for which shoppers are going to do what orders in what sequences so that they all move as fast as possible. 
And then not only are we a logistics business doing the last mile delivery, but we're also an e-commerce marketplace. We have hundreds of different retail partners, millions of different products, and lots of interesting opportunities to uh, make search easier, to help you discover new products, or to purchase products you bought in the past before. So this is a little clip of me going on to Instacart and shopping. Uh, we use our buy it again aisle, which we are sorting all of those items based on a model that's predicting how likely I am to buy them if I showed up on that day. And so for me, with Instacart, I can literally do all of my shopping in 45 seconds because I'm just going through that list and going, yep, 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 nope, yep, yep, uh, and I'm done, right? Kind of the power of algorithms to make the consumer experience easy. So what is Instacart? It's actually pretty straightforward. We deliver groceries from stores you already know and love, like Whole Foods here, uh, or nationwide, or even retailers like Publix in the Southeast, which has thousands of store locations and is a kind of beloved retailer in the Southeast. We deliver them right to your doorstep, right, all the way up to the front door, and we do that in as little as an hour. So kind of a straightforward value proposition, but a fairly complicated experience, and there's two sides to the experience. So first, if you're a customer, you log into the app, and you're going to select one of the retailers. So maybe you're going to pick uh, Berkeley Bowl or Whole Foods. You see all of the items and you start to add to your cart, building up a basket of groceries. You check out and select a delivery time. Uh, and then you wait for the groceries to appear. They're dropped off and you take all of the groceries out of the bags and you put them into your refrigerator or your pantry. And then your pet climbs into the bag and you take a photo of your pet in the bag. And then you put that photo on Twitter and people really like it and you become famous. So this is actually the full Instacart experience. You have to do, have you, know, have you guys, the ones that actually use Instacart, pet and bag, Twitter? Yeah, yeah? okay, that's, that's that, you, you gotta go all the way. So the consumer experience is kind of straightforward. Behind the scenes, there's actually an entirely different application, entirely different teams building it, uh, different infrastructure for the shoppers. Because the shopper is on shift and you know, we uh, assign them an order, they acknowledge that order, they drive to the store, and they're presented with a list of groceries to pick at that store, maybe for multiple different orders. They go through the aisles finding those items, they pick them up, they scan the barcode to make sure that they've got the exact flavor of LaCroix <laughs> sparkling water that you want. They then go out for delivery, they drop them off, you put the pet in a bag, the whole thing kind of recycles, right? Um, so actually, I'm going to spend more time talking about the shopper side and the logistics side uh, than I am the consumer side, but we could do a whole other talk about how we do personalization and search with data. So Instacart, I like to think of as a marketplace, uh, and it's a little bit more than your typical on-demand marketplace because there are actually four different sides. So there are the obvious two sides, which we've talked about. You've got the customers on one side and the shoppers on the other. Shoppers are doing delivery to the customers and there's a customer service relationship back and forth. If you need to think about refunds or replacements, you can talk to the shopper live. So that's a typical on-demand two-sided marketplace. But we also have the stores themselves. Hundreds of different retail partners, tens of thousands of different store locations. All of these store locations have different inventory. So you know, what's the chance that any given item is on this specific store's shelves? Right? That's an important problem. Customers have loyalty to different brands, and the shoppers have to go into those physical stores. And so we need to be able to understand the layout and routing of those stores to be able to help the shoppers. And then the other side of the marketplace are the products themselves, millions of different products, uh, a tremendous amount of information about them, images, nutritional data, uh, descriptions. The shoppers are picking those products off of the shelves, so the identification of those products is important. But then there's a really rich consumer product relationship around search and discovery and also advertising. So grocery is a huge market in the US. 30% of the dollars spent on groceries by all of you are spent by CPGs to advertise back to you. That's where that money goes. 30% of the $100 you spend on Whole Foods ends up turning into advertising to convince you to buy something different. Uh, which is pretty remarkable given how slim the margins are in retail. That's how much money is spent to change your mind. So advertising is a huge part of what makes Instacart uh, successful and exciting. So we're going to talk later about APIs. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For consumer goods, 
begin to standardize that yeah. stuff in the way kind of Walmart standardized what the CPDs were doing or the way in which yeah. um, Open Table has kind of standardized the way restaurants think about uh, their, their reservations? Yeah, it's interesting. So um, we get data from all of our retail partners um, and it varies dramatically. The very best ones will have what are called detailed planogram data. They'll say the Chobani yogurt is in this department, this aisle, uh, this section of the aisle, this position on the shelf, this shelf number, right? They know exactly where it is. They can give us a, 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 essentially a map of the store and we can identify exactly where all of those are. It's a little bit of manual labor. And then we have really a pretty accurate understanding of the store layout. Other retailers, uh, I won't name names, um, have an Excel spreadsheet managed by the store manager in the back that is uh, custom developed to log their inventory. And you know, it's of the matter of the kind of order of got a truck full of watermelons yesterday. They are in the store someplace, right? Um, so wide kind of variability there. Um, you can imagine Instacart building software as a service platforms for point of sale, for inventory management, and like building those really more for the point of like standardizing the information. Um, I think there are other uh, kind of technology-driven ways of doing this that will skip over it entirely. Uh, so building essentially very fine-grained, precise 3D maps of physical environments. Um, so that's where I suspect we'll go, and we'll, we'll, we'll be able to ju jump over some of these problems. You think with the, the customers and the inventory, and you know, I log in and I pick my retailer, to what extent, I mean, sometimes you're looking for maybe a really obscure item, or yeah. your retailer doesn't have the item, looking for, I mean, to what degree do you give shoppers the information that says, well, look, it's not at Whole Foods, but you can get it from Publix right. or those sorts of things? Yeah, so we don't. We've intentionally taken the position we don't want to be a product marketplace. We want to be retailer first. And there's a few good reasons for that. Uh, the first one is moats. You know, our biggest moat are our partnerships with retailers and our tight integrations with them. There's uh, a company in the, in the north that doesn't have those and is gonna have a hard time getting them. Uh, and so it's a, a big defensive competitive advantage for us to have those partnerships. And those retailers would be pretty sensitive if uh, we, you were shopping in Whole Foods and we redirected you someplace else. The other reason is actually more prosaic. Um, if I allow you to buy items from multiple different retailers, it leads to far less efficient fulfillment. Uh, if I've got to shop your order at five different stores, it's going to be almost impossible to make that profitable. And you know, I need to have you order from one specific location. So I think something that we want to do, we're increasingly adding other types of retailers onto the platform. I can't talk about them right now, but there will be some exciting things to come. Uh, those different types of retailers is a great opportunity for us to drive our customers to explore other retailer relationships through the platform without cannibalizing the relationship you might have with Whole Foods through it. Other questions? All right, let's keep going. So, can we succeed? Well, it's really a couple of different key things for us to be successful. The first, you have to have a, a really big market. Uh, the market for groceries just in the US alone, you know, 600 plus billion dollars, you know, check. That's a really big market. Second, you need to be able to achieve some significant penetration in that market. And our customers really love the product, right? It's a, it's a product that uh, drives an in incredible amount of loyalty. Our customers spend a tremendous amount of money with us every month. Uh, so customers love us, we'll be, we'll be able to penetrate that market. So the question is, can we make money, right? That was Webvan's problem. They, they couldn't make any money. Um, and so can we get profitable unit economics? So let me explain to you how we make money, or, or maybe if we rewind the time to two years ago, I can explain to you how we lost money. <laughs> um, so the unit economics are the following. So first we have a bunch of different revenue input. So we get delivery fees from our customers. It's you know, $5 a delivery. Um, if you're not an Express member, if you're an Express member, you spend you know, $150 and get a subscription 
that allows you to waive those delivery fees throughout the year. We also get service fees and tips, which all go to the shoppers. You know, our in-store shoppers that are picking orders one after the next, and also the drivers that may be picking or just doing delivery. Then there are these two other really important parts, the product partnerships, the Procter & Campbell, the uh, Coke and Pepsi, right? All of the big uh, advertisers, they want to be able to reach our customers. You know, Instacart is this wonderful intersection of the ability to identify customers' interests and intent, right? Um, where else do customers in a digital format go and express intent about groceries? You know, nowhere. And so there really isn't an equivalent uh, platform where you can reach sort of with data and intent to do uh, really powerful advertising. And then finally, our retail partnerships. So our retail partners will pay us for every delivery. Uh, and they do that in part because they've got a fixed investment in these store locations and they want to be able to expand that reach. And so it makes sense for them to subsidize the cost of delivery in order to get more customers using those fixed store locations. Then on the bottom side, the costs that we have to consider, the first one is transaction and insurance costs. You know, these are the uh, credit card processing fees, uh, the insurance for the, for the drivers. And then there's also the shopping time and the driving time, right? We ultimately have to ensure that our shoppers are compensated fairly. Uh, and if the you know, service fees and tips aren't sufficient, we have to pay extra to those shoppers to keep them motivated in doing the work. So what's really key to the profitability are many things, but the bottom line, the lion's share of it is the time. And so being able to minimize that time uh, is incredibly important to us. We've made a ton of progress. Um, this chart is old. It's about six months old. Uh, we've been able to hit that next goal and are continuing to push. Uh, but it indexes the total time we were spending picking groceries uh, on a 100% you know, scale and just shows how much we've been able to reduce that time. Uh, and it's through lots of different things that I'm going to take you through. What's interesting about this is this is one of the few examples of where you know, unit economics get better when the customer satisfaction gets better. Right? Because the shorter the delivery time, typically, the, the more satisfied the customer is. Yeah, it's interesting. So there's a more there's a, so I think that's true, right? So uh, if we did grocery delivery next day, uh, that would be a pretty horrible experience. Um, but it's a little bit more nuanced than saying that by reducing the time allows us to offer delivery faster. It's really more about efficiency. Um, it turns out that if we, if we say we're going to do a delivery for you in the next hour, the chance that we're going to be able to deliver that along with five other groceries and a batch of five deliveries is very small. There's just not enough flexibility there. So this is not the time between the order and the delivery, but rather the time between the pickup and the it's the total amount. So, so think about it this way. It's the number of deliveries divided by the number of labor hours we have. So it's you know, how efficient are we at producing deliveries with a given labor hour. And that can happen because our labor hours are highly utilized. right? If our shoppers are sitting idle 50% of the time, we're not going to have a lot of deliveries per labor hour. It can also happen because our shoppers move faster. Now, it's not that we buy them Ferraris right? and they're, they're breaking speed limits. Uh, it's really that they're doing deliveries that are multiple deliveries and denser deliveries so that the time between the deliveries is shorter and we're optimizing to try to drive those factors. Yeah? Was this all driven by that optimization or were there like product choices? Did you scale back geographic scope or retailers or? Yeah. So I, I think probably the product choices around those have led to this being harder, not easier. Uh, so we've added retailers, we've expanded to new geographies, we're blanketing the United States with Instacart, and every time we launch a new geography, it reduces our efficiency some. Um, but there are tons of operational improvements that increase this. You know, if it takes us 10 minutes for a shopper to find the bags for a set of deliveries they have to do when they come to the grocery store, you know, that's a waste of time. If we can better organize how we stage those groceries in the store with operations uh, and make that three minutes, you know, that's a big win too. So it's not all algorithms. It's a combination of algorithms, of incentives, of coaching, uh, of operational changes. Yes? So just curious, do shoppers get paid by the number of deliveries they make, or is it based on the time they spend on the job? So uh, it, it depends. We have uh, part-time employees that are in-store. 
where they're paid more hourly with incentive structures on top. Then we have contractors who do driving and will sometimes come into the store to pick and then deliver. Uh, they have more of an incentive-based structure. In some markets, there may be floors because it's a new market and we don't want them to sit idle uh, and you know, not make money. So we want to incentivize them to continue working. So you know, I, I probably won't say a lot about wages or the structure of them, but that's kind of the high level. Yes. Yeah, we pool orders, and that's a critical driver of efficiency. Yeah. So in some cases, our shoppers are standing in the exact same lines that customers are, especially for partnerships that par uh, for retails, retailers that we don't have deep partnerships with. In some cases, we have dedicated checkout lines where we can do the checkout ourselves. And in some cases, we can check out as we pick. How do you persuade retailers like Whole Foods or Walmart pay you money for every order? Because I think Without the delivery, uh, the consumers will have to buy the same items anyway because they they rely on the grocers every day. Yeah. Then it's like a cannibalization uh, from your delivery into their existing traditional order. Yeah. So um, you know, I'm so I'm not the best person to answer this. The best person would be our head of business development. But I'll try to answer this without like kind of stepping on any toes. Um, which is it's an innovator's dilemma. Uh, namely, uh, a few years ago, no one really thought groceries were going to be online. And so our challenge with retailers was to convince them to even consider working with us. Now, everyone knows this works, and everyone knows it's coming. And so will you be there doing it, uh, or will someone else you know, uh, out-innovate you? Uh, and so I think that's a, a big motivating force. These retailers know that consumers want to get deliveries of groceries. And so they need to be able to support that. It's like if they don't do that, they're going to lose business to other retailers. Other retailers or new, new entrants. Other questions? I love questions. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll do lots of other content, so you'll probably have others. So we've made lots of progress. Um, uh, Gregory, at the beginning, mentioned that we've raised. Uh, so these were some things that our CEO said at TechCrunch last year before we raised. You know, that revenue had grown by 500%, that 90% of our customers repeat, that Instacart Express customers spend about $500 a month, uh, and that we would be cash flow positive in 12 months, meaning that you know, every delivery generates income to us, but that the sum of all of that income would actually offset our fixed costs, like our offices, our personnel. Uh, so since this, we, we raised $400 million at a, a $3.4 billion valuation. Uh, so we're using that money to aggressively expand in the U.S. and really cover the whole country, make Instacart more of a household name. So some of these things probably will, will change you know, as a result of that. So what are the challenges in using data at Instacart? Well, I think there are a few of them. One of them is the four-sided marketplace. It turns out that the more sides you have, uh, the harder the problems are and the more uh, problems you have. Uh, and I think it kind of grows with you know, the... Uh, the power of the number of sides, right? Rather than just uh, kind of multiplying with the number of sides. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, each of these sides of the platform is an opportunity to collect very rich data. And it's an opportunity to influence uh, the service and the operations. And anytime we have an opportunity, inevitably it affects at least two of these sides. Generally, you know, one positive, one negative, or two positive, one negative. Um, and so there's lots of obvious things that you can do that have a clear positive win for one side and a negative win for the other. The secret is how do you do things that are net positive for all of the sides, right? And algorithms and data are oftentimes critical for that, right? Identifying exactly which customers you should show the ads to such that the customers actually appreciate the ads and you still make revenue in the advertising is a, is a classical example. The second challenge we have is variance. A lot of times when you think about data science, when you do the homework for this class, you're probably spending more time trying to optimize mean squared error, trying to get a, a, an estimate of the mean of the outcome. We spend almost as much time thinking about the variance of the outcomes. And I'll explain more later. But variance comes in lots of different shapes and sizes for us. There's you know, the obvious things like the weather, 
uh, when it's really cold and raining outside, would you rather have your groceries delivered? Yes, so suddenly demand surges. When it's really cold and rainy outside, how likely are you to want to uh, go do your Instacart shift that's like a flexible thing where it doesn't really matter if you show up? Less likely, right? So another one of those examples where two sides of the marketplace work at odds with us, uh, and variance really drives that. The second one is the Pope. Uh, he in particular causes a tremendous amount of variance when he visits the different cities in the United States, like he did uh, the year before last. And every time he visited one of those cities, you know, gridlock on you know, some, some giant part of the city and, and our shoppers aren't going to be able to get from stores to the other side, right? Huge disruption. There's maybe not the Pope every day, but some version of the Pope disrupting some of our cities every day. And then finally, there's traffic. Traffic is uh, unpredictable, kind of chaotic, and so it's a constant source of variance. Finally, it's time. It turns out that doing something in an hour is like radically different than trying to do it in 24 hours. Uh, we have to pick all of these different groceries in the store. We've got to stand in the checkout line. We've got to park at the store and at the customer's address. Our shoppers are so incentivized to move quickly that they will park their car underneath somebody else's car in order to get the grocery on time, right? Uh, that's how much it matters. So what are we thinking about when we're trying to solve logistics problems? Uh, so there's really two different sides to the problem. One is balancing supply and demand, where we really need to think about measuring supply and demand, forecasting what it's going to be in the future, scheduling our shoppers, and then adapting, having things that allow us to essentially cushion the variance and control both the supply and the demand side when things don't work out perfectly. The second piece is, okay, given we have a set of deliveries to do, we have a set of shoppers that are on shift at different locations, how do we optimize the routing? How do we predict how long it's gonna take them to do any given task? How do we plan the routes, evaluate the quality of the routes, and ultimately make the dispatch decisions? So let's go through some of these things in a little bit more detail. And I'll start with demand. It turns out that the simple question of how much demand was there yesterday is not a simple question. People come to our site and they'll have a bunch of different delivery options, and you can't quite read this, I know, uh, but these are different hour windows in the future. Uh, and for some of these, they're just regular priced, but in this case, we're actually doing a sale pricing. And in this case, we're doing busy pricing. And so if the customer actually wanted their deliveries here, you know, they're gonna have to pay extra. So there's three different outcomes that can happen from this situation. Uh, the first one is that the customer can check out, and that's great, you know, wonderful, we've got a delivery. The second one is they never had any real intent, the third one, uh, to, check, to, to check out. They were just browsing, right? And so it doesn't, doesn't really matter. But what we care about is when they really did want to check out, but they saw these delivery windows and decided, ah, I'll just go to the store myself. That's real demand that doesn't show up to us as a delivery. And if we ignore it, you can go into what's called a death spiral, right? Where you don't put enough shoppers on shift, you don't have enough availability, your customers see that you don't have availability. They decided to go to the store themselves. You don't do as many deliveries as you did the day before. And so you reduce the number of shoppers because you right, didn't have as much demand. And eventually you'll go down to, to literally no deliveries. So it's very important that we understand this and inject it back into our staffing algorithms. So one of the things that we do is we log every exposure to this availability. And we build models that say, okay, given this customer at this time, at this store, in this geography, saw these delivery options available, saw this busy pricing pattern, what's the chance they're gonna check out? Then what we can do is we can replay history. We can go back through yesterday and estimate the chance that every one of those customers would have checked out had they seen 100% availability and no busy pricing. And that allows us to kind of replay if we'd had an infinite number of shoppers. And literally, we, we do simulations where we have an infinite number of shoppers. Um, how many deliveries could we have done? And that's the best estimate of demand. And so this is the time series of demand where the gray are real deliveries and these orange sections are lost deliveries. Uh, and you can see for this market, we had a kind of chronic period where we were losing deliveries, probably because we had a supply shortage. We hadn't hired enough shoppers you know, fast enough in that market in order to meet deliveries. And so we were regularly turning customers away. And we needed to turn that back into additional hiring and better staffing to ultimately capture uh, this surge of growth that happened once we fixed the problem. Do you uh, try to make any connections between like maybe using loyalty cards? So somebody who looked at availability 
and then went and actually bought something in the store, can you connect one to one and see that? So we do get customers, we do allow customers to put their loyalty card info into the platform so that they can get the points or savings that the retailer offers. But we haven't linked that through to point of sale data or retailer data. Um, yeah, I actually haven't really spent a lot of time talking about that. I'm not sure if there are, you know, if, if kind of the, uh, the privacy constraints of how that data is collected would even allow it. Um, but it, it could certainly be an interesting thing. In general, retailers aren't, um, are pretty sensitive about sharing point of sale data. So does that mean that the recommendations that you make for products are based entirely on their history with the online interactions and the online expression of intent? So That's right. Any bricks and mortar uh, revealed preferences are, are essentially uh, concealed from you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, one thing we've talked about, you can imagine, it would be easy for a customer to scan uh, a receipt and uh, tell us the things that they last bought. So there are interesting, like, simple ways like that that we could bridge the offline to online gap for customers. But the honest truth is um, it doesn't really matter. The intent signals that we get are so strong. And I'll tell you, one of the things that we get that the retailers never get is the search data. So we don't only see what you buy, we see all the things you intended to buy, but maybe couldn't even find, and all the ways you express your interest in finding those things. So it only takes us an order to really start to understand a customer. So given we understand what demand was in the past, the next challenge is, well, what's it going to be in the future? What's it going to be next Thursday? Uh, what's it going to be by different geographies? And so, you know, this is a bunch of different demand curves for different geographies. Uh, what's it going to be within a geography at a bunch of different retailers? What's it going to be within a retailer in a geography by days of the week and time of the day by delivery windows? You know, we need to know all of these things. We ultimately have to make a decision. How many shoppers do I want to have at Protrero Whole Foods uh, next Thursday at 10 a.m.? Uh, where they're only in-store shoppers. Um, how many do I want to have? How long should those shifts be? Uh, and so we need to make a projection. Uh, and one, one of the things we found out is it's actually really, really difficult. It begins with outliers, you know, the Pope visits, the storms. Uh, we can take all of our different markets, our different geographies, look at them over time, and flag days where the pattern of demand or supply varies wildly from the time series-based predictions that you might have. Uh, and so, you know, these different outliers are going to happen kind of in vertical stripes during holidays. You know, this is Thanksgiving, this is Christmas. Um, they'll happen in storms. These are a bunch of different winter zones that were all hit with a, you know, simultaneous uh, storm in the Northeast. And then they'll happen with regional events, right? You know, local festivals, you know, jazz festivals or marathons that will hit individual cities. So we have to identify these and remove them from the data. Uh, so that we aren't biased by them, right? You can get yourself into a lot of trouble if you pretend that last Tuesday's demand is indicative of next Tuesday's demand if last Tuesday there was a marathon and you weren't able to fulfill a bunch of orders. So is there a standardized third-party data source where you can get information about... Events. Events, festivals, and... and uh, yeah, so there, yeah, so there are some, uh, but we end up doing it ourselves. Uh, we have people that are operations leaders in all of these different geographies, and they've been watching these markets. They understand the markets. We collect all of the feedback from them. We analyze our past results and, and make decisions based on that. We haven't found a third-party source that um, is, has enough context about the events to know whether or not they're going to matter. So that means you have somebody sitting there going through the newspaper and saying, oh, wow, there's the, um, you know, hardly strictly bluegrass thing. And, 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 uh, That's right. And then you go back and see what happened last year when the hardly strictly bluegrass thing happened. Yeah. And, you know, you can imagine we don't, we don't get down to tens of thousands of events. You know, we're talking about every month we'll flag 10 or 20 and make adjustments for them. I think a part of it is because um, it's almost impossible to say what's going to happen. You know, you can make adjustments, but we're never right. You know, we think this is going to reduce demand by 10%. It turns out to actually increase it by 5 And you're like, oh, gosh, you know, what the heck? Uh, so uh, the amount of volatility that those events introduce is still so high that it, doesn't, it wouldn't make sense to try to flag them, the micro ones. So then there's the actual uh, modeling and forecasting itself. So we can go back in time at a bunch of these geographies and hold out a bunch of these blue dates. 
And imagine you take one of those blue dates and you say, okay, I'm gonna pretend that I'm back in time. And I'm thinking about Austin uh, last December on the 21st. And I'm gonna use the data before that and I'm gonna build a bunch of different time series models. I'm gonna make a prediction for what's going to happen and I'm going to evaluate, well, how accurate was that prediction? So we can then take you know, time going back historically in a bunch of different forecasting models. These are smooth kind of curves showing the accuracy of, of 10 different forecasting models and see which ones perform better. You know, one of the interesting things you see is that there is this you know, huge spike in volatility around winter, right? It's the holidays. And it's not just Christmas or Thanksgiving. Everybody's patterns of behavior change in the holidays, right? You travel, you're with family, you're not working as much, uh, you're incredibly busy, right? So everything kind of changes and it becomes a lot more volatile. And actually the algorithm that works the best is one of the simplest. Uh, it's you know, a, a, a very uh, conservative algorithm that doesn't perform as well when you get into a more stable time period. Um, so the different algorithm that we might use will depend upon the time of year. Last but not least, we're always making mistakes. Uh, we see markets, even really mature markets like San Francisco, the amount of variance in our forecast is still you know, plus or minus 8% on average. So we're going to be off. We know we're going to be off. And so we need systems that can control supply and demand. So we build a models that will look at our uh, incoming demand, visits on the site, look at the shoppers, the hours that they're working, how busy they are, and estimate our capacity. And then we'll take a bunch of different stores and we'll say, okay, for Safeway, for one hour delivery, we think we could do seven more deliveries at this point. For two hours, 16, 44 from 7 to 8 p.m., 85 from 8 to 9 p.m. And so we're making an estimate for all of these different retailers how many deliveries we think we can do. And in cases where we feel like we can do plenty, uh, it'll be green, just normal pricing. If we feel like we basically have a surplus of too many people, not enough demand, we'll actually reduce the price, in this case, by a dollar. If we don't think we can do any, we'll shut off availability entirely. We're essentially full. Uh, and if we think we're about to run out, we'll start busy pricing and increase that, you know, a dollar, four dollars, sixteen dollars. Uh, such that we try to keep the window open as long as possible for people that are willing to spend the extra money to get the delivery quickly. So that's really balancing supply and demand. I'm gonna talk next about optimizing the fulfillment. Uh, questions about this balancing supply and demand problem. And so do you do experimentation around the, the pricing to figure out exactly how the different price the busy pricing and the price discounts will in fact impact the demand? Yeah, so it's interesting. We don't think about busy pricing as a profit uh, or revenue based objective. Uh, so we're not trying to kind of optimize our profits. We're trying to keep the windows open as long as possible. And so we do do experimentation, but it's more from that perspective. You know, are we setting these curves such that we just run out of availability right before the the window hits. It's mitigated somewhat by the fact that we don't busy price for Express. And Express are a huge percentage of our orders. And so we actually can't shape the demand with this tool as much as we want. Increasingly, what we're trying to do is actually negative price, so give money back and try to incentivize people to place orders where it will be most efficient. Um, so there's a ton of work left for us to do here. This is a, a place where we need to double or triple the size of the team and do more experimentation. Yes, in the back. Yeah. But then how do you how do you factor in the human psychology? Um, I guess everyone here is very used to understanding that if understanding that if you have to receive service at the highest point and the demand is highest, then we have to pay more. But yeah. there are consumers who might feel gouged by that. So yeah. how how does that factor in? Like algorithms are telling you this is what the price pricing should be yeah. at a certain point in time. So I'm just curious how does that factor? No, it's a great question. And I think a big part of the answer to that is it's part of the responsibility of the product team and the user experience team to try to understand and think through the psychology of the customer and at times make you know, kind of judgment calls about how we think about these presentations and what it might mean to the customers. I think the second thing is A-B testing. Whenever we make a strategic change, we will A-B test it to see what the impact is on customers. And ideally, we'll be able to wait and see what's the seven day or the 14 day impact right, versus the one day impact. 
The final piece is actually through data science, we can model the longer term behavior of customers. We can look out over months and see if you were exposed to a really high surge price, you know, all things being equal, how much more likely were you to place a delivery three months out? and try to understand the causal effects through the analysis of the historical data. I think it's fraught with difficulty, so it's a combination of all of these things, like empirical testing, where you oftentimes can't test for the long horizon because it would take too long, analysis to kind of inform, and then ultimately judgment and kind of you know, uh, human evaluation, sitting and watching customers use the service. Uh <clears throat> So it seems like you're not doing any delivery past midnight. Yeah. Um, why is that? And why for like unperishable goods, you wouldn't be able to offer you know, a 2 a.m. leave outside the door? Um, yeah. Um, so now I understand, you know, kind of your life cycle, your daily <laughs> cadence, right? You know, uh, you're assigning too much homework. He's up till 2 a.m. and needs groceries to keep going. I don't think he's working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that may be. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, you're right, you're right, yeah. Uh, so the, the right strategy for MBA is, is to, uh, I think it's to uh, study more than you sleep and sleep more than you drink, uh, and try to drink at least eight hours a day, right? Um, okay, so, um, so why don't we offer delivery late in the evening? It's because the stores are closed, um, and we don't have uh, relationships with many of these retailers to be able to go in and pick the groceries late at night. So yeah. you could be able to like store it in, uh, in a van or one of your choppers and then, you know, or even, or even like buy it at, yeah. I don't know, 8 p.m. if yeah. that delivery had been like planned for, you know, yep. 2 a.m. Like, like, right. So, I mean, I think it's something I, I, would, I would love to be able to support. I think that one, one of the things that we would need to do is probably have staging areas that are off-site or partnerships with these retailers to be able to stay in them late. Um, but one of the challenges is to keep in mind that um, as demand drops, which inevitably it will, uh, we have far less density, far more uncertainty, and the ability to keep shoppers busy it becomes much, much, much harder. So it's like launching a new market that's not going to grow dramatically. Um, so I think there are ways we would want to do that, but it would probably involve the customer needing to pick it up from a nearby staging location. Um, when you guys started out and you didn't have a lot of data and you didn't know, you know as much about the looking pattern, what did you prioritize like we have to get this right and then over time kind of yeah. evolve, evolve that and make that more sophisticated. Right. That's a fantastic question. Um, uh, and I think it's 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 one of the most interesting things about these businesses is in order to launch Instacart, you need no data science. Um, you really just need um, an interface for the customer to do search and to have the catalog. Right? So you can just set up a catalog database, an elastic search cluster, a UI that allows them to search, add those things and do the financial transactions. And then you just need to overstaff shoppers and call them and manually route them. Right? In the beginning, it was the founders doing these things. And all of a sudden, it started to get really busy. And they realized that like, they literally could not physically do all of the deliveries. And they had to start hiring shoppers. I think in the very beginning, they hired one shopper and called him two different names so that they could tell investors that they had two shoppers when they actually only had one. It's like they used his first name and his last name or something. There was some, some funny, funny story like that. Um, so you don't really need much. You can do this very unscalably, but it's unscalable, right? Uh, it's gonna be impossible to make that efficient until you start to add in the data and the algorithms. Um, so I would probably say that the, one of the first things that had to be done efficiently was the routing and assignment. Uh, because as soon as you start to get you know, 10 or 20 shoppers, trying to ensure that they deliver the groceries on time is very difficult for a human to make those routing decisions. Um, and then to ultimately start to make that efficient is impossible for a human to do. And once it becomes 100, 100 deliveries, right? Very, very difficult. The staffing problems and supply and demand man management, that was done manually up until really a year and a half ago. You know, it was different people doing spreadsheets, doing computations to try to figure out how many shoppers do I want of this role type? Um, and when we introduced a lot of the automation that I talked through here, it made things worse. We had to convince the operations team to let go uh, and allow us to make things worse and then learn from those mistakes and improve the systems such that we could learn globally. Uh, that's really hard to do. Uh, so there's all sorts of interesting kind of learnings of how do you release these things and how do you improve them in a real, real product, real environment. Maybe we're missing delivery windows and 
we're learning and the algorithm is getting better, but that's yeah. short term pain of that, right? And are you communicating to the customers? Yeah. Things? Yeah, so uh, the, the app itself is communicating, right? It's telling them what's happening and it's giving them different options. And we have a customer happiness team that's constantly responding to requests and concerns of customers. And so we also have people that are in the market, right? Our operations people communicating with the market, communicating with customers. So it's humans that are the shock absorbers in these transition periods. Yes? Uh, so when you do A-B testing, how do you identify the customers you want to test on? Do you do analysis on that also, or just say 5% of our traffic, 10% of our traffic? So yeah, so typically with A-B testing, it's a random assignment. Uh, it may be a subset of users that we intend to expose. And so we would do the random assignment within that subset. I would say one of the most challenging things is that there are aspects of the logistics side of our business that you cannot A-B test. You can't divide the shoppers into group A and group B and deploy an algorithm for routing for group A that isn't going to affect what happens to group B. Because they are in the same physical environment competing for the same set of orders. And maybe group A looks like it's doing a lot better. Well, it's doing better because it starved group B. Um, so experimentation is actually one of the biggest challenges we have to overcome, and increasingly we are doing simulation instead of experimentation. So why don't I talk about that next piece? So uh, timeliness. Timeliness matters a lot. How many of you have had a cable window that's four hours long, and the cable guy shows up three hours and 45 minutes into the window? And you're like, I know that they were sitting in the truck outside, like, you know, playing Candy Crush, you know, and they came in at the very last minute just so that I could wait this whole four hour window, right? It's, it's, it's annoying. Our customers feel the same way. So if we set a one hour delivery window, we can measure for every customer order how happy the customer is. We ask them to rate us one to five. They are really, really happy if, we're, if we beat the window. They're actually happiest if we show up like five minutes early. They're like, oh my gosh, they said it was going to be 3 to 4, and they showed up at 2.55. Yeah, right? I get to go do something else. And they're happy all the way up until we start to show up towards the end of the window. If we're in the last 10 or 5 minutes, they're like, they were sitting outside. I know it. They were, they were gaming me. Uh, and if we show up late, you know, they're really angry, right? We're going to have to appease them, have to you know, pay them, give them a free delivery, right? It's going to cost us. If we show up early, we can be like 30 minutes early. If we're 45 minutes early, I call it like waking up the baby early. You know, like I'm home, I've got my, my uh, you know, two-year-old, they're in the middle of the nap and somebody comes and knocks on the door and the dog starts barking and I'm like, what are you doing? You weren't supposed to show up for 30 more minutes. No, no none of you guys have little babies. That, that joke didn't go well at all. Okay, so this really matters to our customers and we therefore need to understand how likely is it that our shopper is going to show up at any given point in time in these windows when we're making the assignment decisions. So one of the things you could imagine is, well, what, what can't we just query the Google Maps API and ask for uh, driving times from point A to point B and uh, use that API uh, as the foundation to start this? And you could. Uh, there's actually a technical reason why you couldn't, and it's because we need to evaluate it for many combinations of potential deliveries. And Google gets pretty angry if you do a million API requests a second. Um, so at, at scale, when we're doing planning, we, we couldn't use the API if we wanted to. But more to the point, if you correlate that API to our actual delivery time, you get an R squared of about 25%. Uh, we are able to build models that can significantly outperform that. The reason is our shoppers are different. They're not your average driver on the road. They are picking up groceries, they're doing deliveries, they're moving between you know, places that we see very frequently. And so we're able to build models that can outperform the Google Maps API. So what does it really look like to do a delivery? So let's take this example. Suppose we have four different deliveries, uh, we're going to come up with a plan. Uh, we are going to say, okay, a given shopper is going to be assigned this delivery in the store to pick it. So they're going to go shop for all of the groceries and then they're going to stage it at the store. You know, there's a locker at Whole Foods where we put our groceries into. Another shopper picks this one, is assigned and, and picks it over this period of time. Another one, this one, another one, that one. At this point, they're all staged. And then we have these delivery windows for these four orders. So we need to pick a driver. So we pick a driver who starts out here and we assign the order to them and they acknowledge this batch. They drive to the store, spend this time in the store getting the groceries, do the first delivery, the second, the third, and the fourth. And you can see that they just barely make 
this delivery on time, right? This is the second delivery and it's due right here. So they just barely made that one. Um, so you know, down here they're starting out where they do the assignment. Maybe they just drop groceries off. They drive to the store, pick up the groceries, go do these deliveries in a sequence. So you can see just from this route how much more efficient this is than if you were to drive to the grocery store yourself. Because if we had these four different people all driving to the grocery store and then going back, right, you would be taking eight of these trips. Our shopper essentially does two. And then right here they can park once, drop all of those off, and then park once here and drop that one off. So that's really the efficiency gains that we get through batching. A part of why variance matters so much, right, variance is, is as important as the mean is because there are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different steps that all need to happen in a sequence in order for us to make this last delivery uh, on time. And so if for whatever reason this shopper has a bunch of problems and doesn't acknowledge the batch or picks it really, really slowly, the driver might get to the store and it wouldn't be ready and they wouldn't be able to pick it up. Um, or if this took a long time, they would have been late delivering this one, right? Or if they'd gotten stuck in traffic here, all three would have been late. So how well can your model account for human variance, right? Yeah. Because with pickers, I mean, it seems like you need like, a <coughs> highly skilled picker, right? Like the Toys R Us game from the 90s comes to mind where a kid's like a minute in the store and get as many toys as they want. Right, right. 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 Like, go scout those kids. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a number of things. It's how we hire those people. It's how we onboard them. It's how we coach them, incentivize them, what metrics we show them. And then the app itself. So in the end, right now, there's still a tremendous amount of variance. One of the things I've done is gone back and look at, in what cases have we picked the same 10 or 20 item order at the same store with different shoppers? Right. It's actually a really hard computation. Take you know, millions of deliveries and do the outer join to millions of deliveries to try to figure out which ones had the same sets of items and all of a sudden Redshift explodes and your, your data infrastructure team calls you and says, what the hell are you doing? Um, so it's a hard thing to do, but we found about 50 of these orders where we'd pick large orders with two different shoppers. Many times they're three to four times different in speed. Um, so it really does matter who the shopper is Accounting for that shopper is one of the biggest challenges we have because in planning we've got many millions of deliveries to consider and we've got you know, different combinations of deliveries to consider and then we've also got shoppers to consider and trying to integrate them into that optimization problem is almost impossible. So it's one of the big open things that we're still working on. So one of the things we're going to talk about later today is the interface between the, the data science team and kind of the, the business team. No. And so when you're doing this optimization, there has to be a cost-benefit uh, matrix that yeah. you, you attach, right? right so, right. you know, you have this data on customer happiness, uh, which tells you something about maybe customer loyalty, customer attrition. <coughs> and you have this logistics stuff, which is yeah. about you know, speed. What's the likelihood I'm going to get this delivery there on time? Yeah. But then there has to be some business person sitting in the middle and saying, you know, a five-minute late delivery is going to cost X dollars. And so, when you're optimizing and figuring out how many um, yeah. deliveries to give to one driver, yeah. uh, that, that's going to that's gonna impact your, your algorithm. So, so how does that communication between the, the cost benefit folks and the, um, the optimization folks uh, work? Yeah, so a fantastic question and uh, a really difficult part of this. You know, when we think about the optimization problem that we're trying to solve in this case, there's three different things we want to optimize for. The speed with which the shoppers move, the probability of them delivering on time, uh, and the chance that the shopper uh, gets all of the items the customer wants. And that can be effective because we can choose from multiple different Whole Foods locations. Some are small, some are big, some are close, some are far away. So we've got those three different things. You can try to come up with, uh, well, what's the cost of an idle hour or a slow hour? We know how much we pay the shoppers. So you can translate that into the effective wage that we pay for work. And that's a reasonable way of getting at that. What's the cost of being late? Right, if we go back to this, we know how much it affects the customer happiness. We can ask the question, well, how much do we have to appease these customers? Certainly, the cost should be more than that, right? Because that's, that's how much we're spending to keep them happy. We can try to correlate this to what happens in the future to those customers and come up with a lifetime value impact. That is like 
uh, witchcraft math, right? It's impossible to do well. And so at a certain point, for things like, you know, we're doing this, and it's a very collaborative discussion. Um, and uh, same thing for refunds. You know, how, we know how much that matters in terms of happiness, but how do you translate that into the lifetime value, the expectations of the customer? So uh, a part of it is um, to set guardrails. You know, what do we want the problem? You know, how, how often are we willing to be late? And what do we think is an acceptable percent? And let's make sure we don't exceed that. And let's try to optimize with that as a constraint. So that's one way of simplifying these problems. Um, but it's still, I think, another one of those things that's an open question for us. How do we put exact value on these things? I talked to the head of product at Netflix early on. And you know, they decided to double the value of the customers for network effects. If I lose this customer, I lose their friends. So they just doubled it. He didn't have complex math behind it. It was just an assumption. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm playing, I just, oh yeah. Um, do you use big data, uh, your uh, algorithms to test for what is the optimal uh, vehicle that you or shoppers should be using? Uh, no, we take whatever vehicle they have. We know the type of vehicle and we consider it when we assign them batches. We don't want to send somebody to Costco to do a delivery for three orders that have 500 items if they've got a two door. Yes. In, in the previous slide, where you for the four deliveries, yeah. is, is, if you have enough scale, would this, uh, you know, would this cause like a serious like, operations problem for like, the safe place where they're used to the neighborhood people coming there, but now these people are getting their groceries from possibly different safe place? Uh, so, m mainly you mean in terms of traffic in the store, or are you thinking not, of something else? Yeah, so it doesn't happen overnight. So they're able to adapt and react over time. Increasingly, this notion of can we check out as we pick the groceries is an imperative for the, for the retailers because they don't want to clog the checkout lines. Um, and you know, I, can, I, I don't think I can say a lot more, but there's a lot of other things that we can do to solve that problem. Yeah. Are the drivers the same as the shoppers? So there are dedicated in-store shoppers that are part-time employees that pick order after order after order after order. Then there are drivers who can go and pick and do deliveries, or they can go pick up a set of things that have been picked already and deliver them in a sequence. That flexibility is critical. One of the major learnings we have is queues. Uh, basically, when we dedicate these in-store shoppers at different store locations, they become a queue. Uh, and the volatility of demand that we see for that store location is huge compared to the volatility of demand we might see for the city as a whole. So if we only had in-store pickers, that picked the groceries and drivers that only drove, we would only we would have to staff for the upper bound of all of those queues. And people would sit idle all the time. So because we have this flexible labor force that can both pick and deliver or just deliver, we can get the efficiency of this kind of handoff model while maintaining the flexibility of not being swamped by all of those little queues. Do you see the real opportunity here to not, it's not the dollars, the, not the advertising dollars or even like percent of purchase. It's like all these stores could basically go away. Yeah. So it's the overhead for Safeway that you could save them. If no longer they have to have a consumer store for it. So, so is that the real value add here? Uh, it's a great question. I, I don't know, right? Uh, I don't know how uh, society is going to change in, react to the, in reaction to this. My intuition is that people enjoy shopping. And in 100 years, that may change, right? But in 20 years, people will still enjoy shopping. At least I'll still be alive. And you know, uh, people that I know enjoy, I don't. But you know, my wife does. Um, and so I suspect it's more that the stores will change. And there'll be an experience rather than a um, uh, task or a you know, obligation. Um, if a sufficiently large number of orders are fulfilled through uh, a portal like Instacart, yeah. uh, does have in store does in store picking make any sense? Right, where you could have a warehouse that is a located where there's cheaper real estate, yeah. and b have uh, shelves that are 
um, more densely packed with you know, little kivas going and picking up uh, the, the, the yeah. items rather than... Yeah, you can totally imagine dark stores. You can imagine the sophistication that DHL you know, or any of those other companies have in their warehouse operations that can drive picking time down dramatically. I think the, the interesting challenge is that in order to do grocery delivery at the highest level, you need to think about the long tail, right? There's millions of different products. And if you want 20 products and I can only give you 18, you go to the store, right? I need to have all 20. Perishability, these things. Uh, uh, is it, it, it's easier for a retailer to maintain long tail items at central warehouse locations as opposed to, uh, you know, yep. Last mile That's right. But, but 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 stay with me because we've got we've got long tail, which you know is is better at a at a at a warehouse. Perishability, right, which is maybe better at a warehouse, but actually a lot of what benefits from warehouse is that you can have items just sitting there indefinitely, and you can move them around, right. As soon as things are perishable, uh, you know you 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 uh, that you lose a lot of that benefit. You have timeliness, so this one's critical. We want to be able to get the groceries to people quickly. And so the warehouse strategy of in, you know, if you're here and you've got a warehouse out uh, east of the Berkeley, of the Oakland Hills, you're never going to be able to get that into San Francisco quickly enough. And then you've got uh, cost. And so the only way to do all of these things is to have a warehouse sitting close to the customer, right? And to have a tremendous amount of demand such that you can still merit stocking the long tail and dealing with the spoilage of those long tails. The only way to do that is to pick from the stores. And so we're able to kind of start this because of that. It's the problem that we were talking about before. Over time, you know, we'll be able to build in the infrastructure to make it more and more efficient in partnership with the retailers. Uh, but Amazon's facing a really tough challenge of if they want to do this, right, to do long tail perishable, fast, cheap, is you know, tens of thousands of store locations, of warehouse, dark warehouse locations. Yeah. Yeah. So discovery is one of the really interesting opportunities for us, right? Whole stores are laid out to force you to wander through lots of useless aisles to find the eggs at the back, such that they hope that you find new products and buy them. So we have um, a new arrivals aisle on the store that shows you know, the items that have recently appeared at that store location. We can also use things like deep learning to understand from the image of the product, the description of the product, how similar it is to other types of products and ultimately how likely you might be interested in it. Uh, so by using that unstructured data, even though we've never seen anyone purchase it, we can begin to get an insight into who we might want to surface it for and recommend it to. And as soon as a few people start buying it, we start to see whether or not it's really getting traction and it gets better. So you mentioned Amazon. How are you able to compete and defend against someone who knows logistics, has the scale and resources? Retailers. How so? <laughs> uh, uh, it's, the, it's kind of what I've been talking about, that uh, retailers have tens of thousands of store locations close to customers. We have partnerships with those retailers. look closely at what retailers they work with. I don't want to say more about this. Uh, I'll get in trouble. <laughs> Sorry. So the difference between the picker and the driver? Yeah. Uh, well, we have refrigerated uh, uh, storage at the store location. So something like milk we can refrigerate. We want to do unattended deliveries where we have to have special um, uh, uh, bags to leave them at your doorstep that can uh, handle food safety concerns. Um, so food safety is an issue on unattended deliveries. Yeah. We, we, we do these uh, experiments in which we have virtual stores, so virtual mm -hmm. reality. Yeah. So, so you could actually do the store walk in, in a virtual world? Yes. Discover new items and then virtual stuff. Yeah, and in fact, we can ultimately create a store, a virtual experience for you that is unique for you. 
So you can imagine having a store entire, a, phys, a, a, a virtual store entirely tailored for your interests. If only we can simulate taste virtually. I asked the head of VR at Google, and he said that's a ways off. <laughs> okay, let me keep going. So once we've got those deliveries, it's, it's actually like this is the easy part. I'm afraid to say, the hard part is let's say we've got a small problem, 300 different orders, and we can only do three orders per trip. And we've got 100 different shoppers. 300 choose three, so different combinations of taking three orders out of 300 population. With 100 different potential shoppers, there's 445 million combinations that could be considered. Come up with the subset of those 445 million such that every order is in one and only one batch, all of the orders are going to be delivered on time, and the shoppers move as fast as possible. Go. We've got 15 minutes. Right? So it's an impossible problem. It's uh, literally impossible. Right? It's, it's, you need more compute resources than you have in the sun to do this problem at scale. Um, so m trying to do all of these three things is impossible. So what do we do? We start with greedy heuristics. This is uh, back to the question that Sherry asked earlier. How do you get started? You can do something really silly, kind of almost. Which order is uh, due next that hasn't been assigned? Oh, well, shoot. Maybe we should take that order and give it to somebody. Uh, who can do that order the fastest? Let's give it to that person. Are there any other orders that we could also give them that they could do such that the first one that we gave them wouldn't be any more late than it is? Um, and these other orders would likely be on time. Okay, let's do that one. Is there any more? Okay, no. Which orders do next? <laughs> Which shopper can do that fastest? Iterate, right? That's a very simple kind of linear algorithm that will proceed through this and give you a not terrible solution. The problem will be you will end up in situations where you basically have a sunk cost of an order that's going to be late. Uh, and you're going to end up creating four more late deliveries by doing everything you can to make it a little less late. Uh, and so we end up in these suboptimal situations. So some of the things that we do, one is to try to unify these objectives, what I was talking about with Greg earlier. Can we combine them all together into one global objective function, or do we need to introduce them as constraints and solve for some of the others? We can decompose the problem. Uh, ignore the shoppers. What's just the combination of the deliveries such that they minimize distance uh, and are clustered together in time? Uh, solve that subproblem, and then solve a second subproblem that is what's the optimal assignment of the shoppers to these clusters of deliveries. So maybe there are situations where by breaking them apart, we lose some things, but it's better than the really naive approach that I described earlier. Increasingly, we're doing simulation. So we're uh, building kind of an alternative universe, a representation of what we would expect to happen, you know, running thousands of different simulations of demand patterns and routing. Uh, to see, well, should we open this new store location and put in-store shoppers there? What hour of the day should they work? Uh, what's the right optimization algorithm for this problem? You also factor the customer history. Let's say you have to choose between two customers and say one of the customers has to be later. I'm going to look at his history and the one ah. that last time didn't have any later. Yeah, we don't. Uh, certainly you could. Um, it's a bit of a principled question of do you want to create a situation where some customers might experience a long-term degraded experience because they don't complain? Because um, that's kind of what you would, you would you could end up in situations like that. And you can actually end up in trouble. Like at one point, Netflix had a class action lawsuit for shipping to some customers over others for kind of profit maximization purposes. Um, so uh, if you don't treat your customers consistently, you need to be explicit about that. Uh, if you're offering a service. So you just flip a coin in those cases. Uh, yeah, so it's not so much that we're flipping a coin. Um, it's that we have an objective function, and we're trying to minimize it globally. And so it could be that, we, that you're the unlucky you know, component of that objective function, and that's, uh, in essence, random. Yes? Do you try and incentivize your users to order at certain times? times? Like, if my neighbors are ordering you know, from the same yeah. place, uh, you try and steer them into the yeah, so not yet, uh, but it's something we want to do. Uh, one of the ways I'd like to do that is through, essentially, you can maybe even do it without e even spending anything. Yeah. Just showing customers uh, when will they have the least impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. 
So some of what we were able to do, I'm not going to really, it doesn't really matter. We were able to make things better. Um, what I think is interesting is that there are multiple objectives. So let's take the kind of balancing supply and demand side. Uh, utilization, we want it to be higher. We want people to spend 90% of their time on shift working, right? Not 80% or 70%. Lost deliveries, the number of people that come to the site and walk away because they didn't have a good delivery option, we want that to be lower. Less than, say, 3% of the time somebody comes to the site, we want them to, to walk away because they can't get their delivery windows. Each of these dots is a week uh, through a journey trying to optimize these things jointly through changes in technology and algorithms. So week one, we had really poor utilization, but great loss deliveries. We were just overstaffing, and shoppers were sitting idle, 60% utilization, 70% utilization. But whenever you came to the site, you, know, you had delivery options. We made some changes, and, and people were kind of happy. We were moving in the right direction, and then, oh, holy shit, uh, we went too far. <laughs> And shoppers are sitting at 90% utilization, and we've got 15% of people coming to the site walking away because they can't get a delivery option. Um, and the really painful part is it can take time to figure out how to change and fix those things. Uh, and so imagine being in my shoes over the course of three weeks while the business is panicking <laughs> and trying to figure out how do we get this back and how do we make sure people are, are okay with it and like this is the right investment and, and, and things are going to get better. Eventually, we got down to this point and we're able to slowly move back and forth and really drive the efficient frontier to the bottom and right. And that's the power of the data and the algorithms is moving the efficient frontier. We could have just changed an overall forecast for supply, right, or for demand and moved from here to there. You can go up and down that efficient frontier all you want by just changing a constant. Uh, it's the algorithm that moves the frontier. Okay, uh, so that's the logistics. So. Who wants to talk about deep learning with emojis, not math? Or should I just skip that section? No? You guys want to, you guys want to do that? Okay, great. Um, so I'm not going to go into this in all of the detail. There's a blog post that does. The problem is... Yeah, none of you will read because you've got too much homework. So the problem is we have a shopper app that has a bunch of different items. Maybe you've got 50 items you need to pick as a shopper. How do we sort those items? Which one comes first, the next, the next, the next, such that the shopper can move as fast to the store as possible? We've got to do this for hundreds of retailers, thousands of stores, tens of thousands of shoppers, you know, millions of products. So it's not an easy answer. Lots of, lots of complexity in data here. And so you might be thinking, well, you know, Jeremy, aren't you kind of getting this a little bit too complicated? Can't you just build warehouses? Well, the answer is no. It's not a part of our business model, right? Um, maybe in the future, but certainly not right now. Can't you just get store data? Yes, sometimes we can get the planogram data that's precise, but sometimes you've got the truck full of watermelons shows up. Can't you just map things manually? The answer to this is yes, you can at a certain level of granularity. It, once you identify that all of the LaCroix water is uh, at the same location no matter what store you're in, you can call that a cluster of products. You can ask somebody to go into the store every week and identify where that cluster of products is located, pin it on a map. You can't do that frequently in a cost, a cost uh, kind of uh, conscious way. Uh, and these things are changing all of the time because the stores are uh, constantly being paid to shift these products around. End cap displays, store placement, that 30% of the $600 billion market, a lot of that's being spent to tell the retailers to shuffle things. Can we just map it all with technology? The answer there is actually yes, but not quite yet. Um, so you know, increasingly, we're looking at indoor GPS-like solutions that will allow you to get millimeter precision within the store, uh, image recognition that allow you to identify what product is in an image in the store. So there's a lot of interesting things to do with technology, but it's not so quite it's here yet. This would be like a little Google map car that we, you would just run up and down the aisles, have a little one of the <coughs> camera that goes around and circles and so that's, a, that's, that's, that's definitely an opportunity. That's an, that's an option. There may be other uh, better ways to do it. Um, uh, ways to leverage this uh, in the hands of our shoppers at all times. So what do you do when you have a hard problem? You, you spread deep learning on it. That's the, that's the new thing you do. You just Everything gets better. Um, so uh, I'll talk about the test results. So 
The first thing is uh, the graph. So we've got the size of the batch, how many items are being picked by the shoppers. And then we've got the speed, how many items per minute are they picking. And I don't actually have the axis labeled because this is a sensitive KPI for us. But if you do a control sorting variant, which is essentially take the departments and sort them randomly, and then within the departments sort alphabetically, it's a pretty simple thing to implement. Uh, our shoppers you know, get faster as the batch size increases. Why? You know, any ideas why shoppers might get faster as the batch size increases? Yeah. Are they making fewer decisions? It's more just yes, 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 yes? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's a part of it. As you have more items, there's a higher likelihood that those items are close to one another and that they're grabbing more than one. So density. There's, there's, a, there's a slight variation of his point, though, that still exists, too. Anyone got that one? So there's this problem that we see. Shoppers pick 13 items of a 14 item order in a very nice, efficient way. And then they start going like this. And they're wandering the store looking for that 14th item. So as the batch size gets bigger, they're less likely to do that because they will just have encountered it through the kind of brute force tour of the entire store. Um, so it's those two different things. So then we have a human sorting where we've sent people into stores, labeled clusters of products, identified where they are, uh, tried to identify what's, what we think is the right kind of sequence to go through those clusters of products and you know, sort the aisles by that. It's significantly better. Shoppers move faster with that. So, so what's the, what about the error? There's an error rate speed trade-off, presumably. I know yeah. Amazon is famous for designing their warehouses with similar items spread out geographically for human pickers because if yeah. you know, someone asks for the Honey Nut Cheerios and they get the, the regular Cheerios because they're just, you know, they, they look similar, they're right next to one another. And this yeah. Sort of yeah, so we scan the UPC codes. Okay. So that's the major protection we have against that. The bigger human error issue we have is somebody says it's not there and it's because they didn't know where it was or they didn't look hard enough for it. That's, that's a problem that we need to get better at, but it requires the mapping. Uh, we have a traveling salesman solution. So we can observe the time between picks. We can take the departments. We can think about that as uh, essentially a distance metric between all of the departments. If you're picking meat and seafood, how long does it take you to pick uh, uh, the bread? Uh, we can then do a traveling salesman solution over that graph and present things in that order. It's about as good as the human uh, decided sorting. Uh, not as good for a few reasons. One, shoppers want to pick the frozen things last because otherwise they'll get warm. And if you show them a TSP solution that doesn't adhere to that, they have to re-scroll and kind of redo things. So it's not really learning everything that is important. There's more than just speed that matters for the shoppers. So then we have the deep learning approach that we've implemented, which is actually improving over the human and the TSP solution by about 50% uh, more than what you have for uh, control uh, at these larger batch sizes. At the small batch sizes, it turns out that you know, they're all better than random, but it doesn't really matter that much. If you're shopping for 15 items, the shopper can load them all into memory and just you know, shop for them very efficiently. So what's like your typical order size and does this kind of incentivize you to have customers start doing larger orders? Yeah. So great answer. Uh, you know, the typical order size is um, are probably going to be between you know you know twenty and thirty. Um, yeah, I can't give you an exact number. Um, these are batches, so a full service shopper might pick two or three orders simultaneously, or an in store shopper might pick multiple orders simultaneously. So we have an incentive to drive that batching rate up, so that they can pick faster. But then you have to sort them out. And there's possibly errors in the sorting if you're not scanning the item scanning bags. So there's always trade-offs in these things. Uh, your question about driving up basket sizes is a great one. That actually is super important, not just for this, but for our overall economics. Because uh, service fees, tips, uh, the retailer relationships, the CPG is all scale with the size of the basket. Delivery costs, driving your car, it's fixed. So if we can drive larger basket sizes, uh, we make more money. Yes, in the back. Um, yeah, so there's a, a, a few reasons. Um, the, uh, so ultimately what we're learning in deep learning, so let me actually, let me answer that question a little later because I've got a few more slides that I think you can grok that may help. Come ask it again if I don't. 
So what does this really mean for us? If we have 125 million households, if we just did a 1% market share in those households and one trip per week saved a minute on all of those trips, it is 123 years of continuous shopping saved every year. Um, and it's like the painful part of the shopping, right? It's the rent winding, going around the store looking for that thing you forgot. Okay, so emojis, right? I told you emojis, I promised emojis. Suppose that a customer has ordered these 10 items and we see a shopper having picked them in this sequence. We can observe that sequence. We see them you know, scanning the barcode on all the items or weighing the item and entering in the number of pounds of potatoes that were purchased. So if we can learn that sequence, then we can predict that sequence for the fastest shoppers and show it to our shoppers. And maybe that will be a better way to sort the list. And so it's a question, can we learn that sequence? Really, the question is simplified. We're in a store, we just picked bread. We can choose from cookies, chocolate, pizza, meat on the bone, or coffee. Which one should we pick next? Well, in this case, the shopper chose the cookie. So in emoji math, and this is one of the real benefits of working at Instacart is you can do emoji math. We want to find an estimate for the probability that the next item picked is a cookie, given the last item was bread, and the candidates were that set. Now there's lots of obvious, simple ways of estimating the probability that next is cookie given last is bread. You could just count that. How many times did we pick bread? Okay, what's the fraction of the times that we picked cookie after bread? What's the problem with that? How many of you eat cookies? Lots of you eat cookies. How many of you eat sweet potatoes? Quite a few people. Maybe this isn't great. Uh, <laughs> how many of you eat nutritional yeast? Nobody. Okay. One person. One person. So what is the probability that cookie will come after bread compared to the probability that nutritional yeast will come after bread? Much, much higher. But should you always pick cookies after bread and not nutritional yeast? No, because it's conditioned. And so if we don't account for those conditionings, we will learn the composition of baskets, not the sequence that you want to pick items in. So it turns out that that's kind of the secret. Uh, this is the, the, the sort of deep learning architecture. We take products and embed them, shoppers and embed them, uh, stores and embed them, and shoppers and embed them, have a bunch of hidden layers, account for the candidate set, and ultimately make a prediction. And then we look at what was the actual item next, and you can say, oh, well, you know, how good was that prediction given cookie was next? And you can, with deep learning, go back and tune what amounts to tens of millions of parameters to optimize these predictions to be very high when cookie was in fact next. Okay, so the problem with we come to talk about this class is that you know, you're going to be training on your best pickers, right? So in this case, we actually embed the shopper, and so we train on everyone. At runtime, we will make a prediction either for the individual shopper or for the best shopper at that store location. And, and then present start, it. Once you start providing recommendations to the, to the shoppers and, and they start following them, then you no longer have any, anybody to train on. So, so how yeah. do you make sure that the, the deep learning is continuously improves? So the objective here is to present the list in a sequence the shoppers will follow. And our shoppers will not follow a bad list. So they're always correcting us. Uh, I think there may be opportunities to change this and model the time between picks and account for the kind of preferences around sequencing to have a more ground truth that might cause shoppers to change so, so their have, behavior. So you have to give the shoppers the, the, the flexibility and freedom to override it. That's right. And, and, the, 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 and they the, do. But the, but the, you know, with the, the problem that Uber has, I mean, that um, the Tesla has run into is that if you give somebody a, a recommendation list, then they sometimes will just kind of shut down their thinking. Yeah. And, and then, you know, they won't be injecting that new information that's right. back into the, the, yep. the algorithm. Yeah, that's right. That's why I would like to ultimately move this back towards an estimate of time, something based more on physics than on human behavior. But we present the items in a list, and our shoppers can scroll. And keep in mind that they're walking through the store, and they see the thing or they don't. And so if they, if they don't see it, they'll, they'll, they'll keep going and they'll come back to it later when they do. And so they're going to naturally, you know, course correct on the list. So that's not a problem yet, but it will it may be in the future. Yes. Do you ever have multiple shoppers picking for the same 
basket? So uh, yeah, actually, I talked about that a little bit earlier. That we went and found you know the situations of that, and they they can do them in radically different orders, radically different times. Um, but I mean, I mean, if they've got like, oh, at the same time, collaborating yeah, together. Yeah, separating out maybe a store into two different areas. So we so we don't do that. Like a zone picking yeah. is the strategy in a warehouse. Uh, we don't do that yet. Uh, the challenge is how do you recombine those orders in a in a staging area, and and um, we will probably do things like that in the future. So without explaining deep learning, um, a big part of why this works so well are these embeddings. And so we can focus on, on this. Essentially, what an embedding is, is you take a product, bread. It's a, one of a million different potential products. And you learn 10 million parameters, essentially a matrix, that projects each of these items into 10-dimensional space. And so the bread might be close next to the pita, right, in that 10-dimensional space, but very, maybe very far away from the cookie or the, the fish. And the model is going to learn an arrangement in 10 dimensions that maps all of these products such that it can use that information combined with the similar arrangements for the shop and the shopper to ultimately make these decisions. What's cool is there's something called TSNE, which is a projection. It's like principal components analysis, if you've heard of principal components analysis. Uh, it projects a high-dimensional space to a smaller space in a linear way. TSNE does it in a nonlinear way, where essentially geometry is maintained. And so this is a two-dimensional representation of what the model has learned in 10 dimensions. And you can already see that there's a clear clustering. Each of these dots is a product. And all of these products are close together. These are close together. But this is a little bit away from that cluster, meaning there's something different happening there. And there's a little trail of items that are kind of bridging that maybe behave you know, differently in different situations. We can color it. We can use the department data to identify which of these products are in meat and seafood up here, which is blue. I didn't train on department. So the model never knew this department information, but was able to reconstruct it in the learning process. It was able to figure out the prototypical layout of a store. And one of the things that's really cool is that there are a bunch of these items that aren't blue that are next to meat and seafood. And if you look at the actual items, they're spices and rubs and tools, things that you might not call meat and seafood if you're categorizing, but are going to be typically sold at the meat and seafood counter. And so they're going to be close, but not exactly commingled with it, just on the edge. So I think this is a big part of what deep learning is able to do. Another part of what it's able to do is learn how a different shopper might take a different route. One goes clockwise, another counterclockwise. So they have different preferences for where they start. Uh, and then it can generalize. So we've never seen a product before. How do we sort it? Well, we can use the image of the product, the text of the product, the department and the aisle of the product to position it in this space along with its peers. And it will behave like other products that we've seen in the past that are similar to it until we have enough data to justify moving it into some other part of that space. So this is the article. Uh, if you're curious, you can learn more. Quest questions about, about this? Yeah? Uh, how do you classify um, items that don't have a barcode or is it, you know, like, like different types of apples? Yeah, so the, uh, we tell the shopper the, the, as much information as we can, the product name, description, the image. And it's up to them to identify and weigh that product and validate it that it is the right thing. Um, so we still have like department aisle image description, but there's not a barcode, so there's a risk of error. You know, we we especially like herbs. You know, it can be really easy if the herbs are fresh, right, to pick the cilantro instead of the parsley. So you know, we try to train shoppers to be able to discriminate between the different types of important products, but we're not always going to be right there. Yes. String for one particular retailer, or is it like yeah. uh, in general, we are saying that this kind of product is stays close to this? So this specific visual, yeah, this specific visualization was for our largest retailer, uh, an early version of the model where we were building it with only one retailer. Um, but the production model builds across all of the retailers simultaneously, and so it learns a global, you know, in the, in the production model, thirty-dimensional representation of products that can then be distorted through the hidden layers with the representation of the stores in order to understand how different stores distort that space. 
Other questions? Curious, was this at all interesting? Was this like too much or was this cool or you guys liked it? Okay, okay, that's, that's good to know. Some people are just like, oh, it's too, it's too early. Um, okay, cool. So the other topic I wanted to talk about was data science with teams. Um, we've only got about 20 minutes until I need to leave. So uh, I can do a few, I can do five or 10 minutes on this or we can just do questions because I know you want to do an interview. Um, so why don't we do like five minutes uh Five minutes on this. Okay. Five, ten minutes on this. Yeah. So uh, I wrote an article on um, doing data science right and building teams and what does it really look like and, and how do you how do you think about doing that? I wrote it with somebody from LinkedIn, and I like to preface with the fact that um, this is me. It's not actually me, but uh, it's me metaphorically. Uh, and these are the people that have come before me, right? Designing teams and and doing this at scale. And this is all of the stuff that we don't know about how to organize teams, right? So very, very early in how we think about uh, data science. Engineering, right, I think we've spent a lot of time thinking about how we organize engineering teams. There's still constant learnings there. Data science is still pretty early. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time with folks from Facebook, Airbnb, Spotify, LinkedIn, Netflix, you know, talking to them, understanding what it is they do. And so this is an accumulation of lots of different discussions. I like to define two different types of roles in data science. There's data products, which is very mission driven, and it's a collaboration with engineering. So I want to build the very best shopper application I possibly can. I want to think about how to sort the list. I want to think about how to make the right replacement suggestions for our customers to our shoppers. That's an intense collaboration with the engineering team, and it's a mission driven goal. Uh, and it's going to be a, let's build an MVP product, something really simple. Let's get some market fit. Let's collect some usage data, then do machine learning, A-B testing, and improve the product. And that will lead to even better data and a virtuous cycle of continuous iteration. Then there's what I call decision science, where it is a question driven. You know, uh, how much would we gain if we changed our price? Right? That's, a, that's a strategic question. Um, should we try to build this feature to address a specific customer need? Right? Another very important question. It's a collaboration with leadership. It could be leadership uh, in engineering. It could be product leadership, operations, you know, uh, finance, uh, marketing. Um, and really the cycle for this is a complication arises that triggers this question. Data collection is ongoing or is triggered by the question. Analysis is done, building of statistical models, summarization of data, visualization is done to understand that analysis. And then communication uh, occurs and ultimately a decision is made, but oftentimes there's a lot of loops, right? Going back to data collection uh, to uh, begin this over again. So these are two very, very different activities. When I interview people, one of the things that I ask uh, in every interview where it's not abundantly clear is which of these are you better at and which of these do you most enjoy doing? Uh, and I find that 80% of people clearly lean towards one or the other. The other 20% really do enjoy roles where they can do both. Uh, and I think that that's wonderful to do this really well. It's actually wonderful if you can do your own decision science. And to do this really well, it's wonderful if you can use the sophisticated techniques and tools and understanding of the product over here. So they are, you know, they do overlap. Uh, I've got some examples of what these cycles look like. I'm going to skip through. Um, you, get the, you get the point. You can look at the notes. So one big question is, when do you build a data science team? And I don't think the right answer is to have a data scientist on day one. Um, you know, it's maybe not in my best interest to say that because, you know, maybe, uh, you know, more, I, we have more data scientists being hired or I don't know, whatever. I think you should wait. Uh, at the very beginning, the key things to know is, are you really committed Right? Are you going to build a culture where data is used in every decision? And you beware the opinion of the highest paid person in the room. What is the data you're going to have? Right? A lot of businesses don't have uh, data or the ability to act on data that's going to really justify a significant investment. And then when you have that data, how core and critical are the questions you're trying to answer? How unique are they to the business that you're creating? If it's trying to score leads, well, you know, you're one of 10,000 companies trying to score leads. There are lots of third-party services that can do that for you. If you've got an incredibly unique product where the buying cycle is very unique and different, maybe you need to ultimately think about investing in data science to be able to do that because nobody else is going to build that as a service. It's too novel. 
The different skills, you can read through this as well. I take Drew Conway, who's a friend of mine's, you know, he kind of hates this now, the Venn diagram. Uh, I think he gets, I think he talks to me less and less the more I, I use this in talks. Like he knows, he gets, he gets like a, a buzzing sound in the back of his head every time somebody puts this on a slide. Um, but I link, it's still, it's, it's, it's a good framework. I link uh, all of these different stages to the different kinds of practical skills that happen in those three buckets. The other really interesting thing about data science teams is how do you organize them? And I've seen three different types of models. Uh, one is a standalone model, which is driven by the data science itself. And everybody reports to one centralized team. Uh, you've got a lot of autonomy in that team, but the weakness is it's easy to be marginalized. You don't actually control any business unit. You're not working with the engineers. Maybe nobody listens to you, right? So that can be a big problem. Typically, these people all sit together. The next one is embedded, which I think of as being a little bit more problem driven. So everybody still reports to the same person, but they are you know, sitting with a specific team a lot of the time. And whenever that team has a specific problem, they're gonna be able to go in and address that. The problem is they may miss context. They're brought in after the product's already built and the logging infrastructure is set. And you know, they can no longer affect the kind of core upfront decisions that would have driven the possibility of what they might do. The final answer is to integrate them. <clears throat> Where you literally, you know, this is the data scientist right here, it's a little hamster. <laughs> you, you have them sitting in the team, reporting to the same technical lead for the team. Uh, and the beauty is that the, you really have really high ownership, not just the data scientist, like they can own things from beginning to end the team. Data science becomes the team's problem. Uh, and I think that's a frame of kind of mind change that's incredibly powerful. If the engineer who's responsible for the interface, the engineer who's responsible for the logging, you know, both feel as passionate about the potential of data science as the person who's doing the fancy algorithms, you end up with a lot better product. The challenge is how do you go from zero to one? You either put the person in too early and they're bored, or you put them in too late uh, and you've missed some context or opportunities. Okay, uh, I think the major thing is what Andy Grove said about this problem you know, 15 years ago, not for data scientists, but for businesses in general, that you know, management is a recon reconcili reconciliation of centralization and decentralization. Um, and a balancing act is to get the best combination of responsiveness and leverage. He basically went on to say, uh, he thought that at times you should centralize things, maybe have a more functional business model, and then at other times go to something more distributed where you've got geographic regions that duplicate the functional responsibilities. And that maybe it was most important that you kind of move back and forth and maintain flexibility over time. I talk about how do these things change as the company evolves, a little bit about how we organize. We're super mission driven. We've got lots of different teams driving different things. These teams have data scientists, engineers, designers, mobile, uh, analysts, product managers. Uh, and then we bring together cross-functional teams when we need to, to tackle complicated things like, oh, let's go from a manual staffing process to one that's entirely automated. That's not a team goal, it's a company goal. And it's a company driven kind of collaboration process, but it's something that dies, right? that effort doesn't go on forever. At some point in time it ends, and it is then supported by the teams that are driving the work. Talk about hiring uh, and hiring practices. Uh, I'll skip over that uh, in evaluating performance. Real quick on culture, I've seen kind of three different types of culture in data science, where the team is being pulled in lots of different directions and they're unhappy where the team is having fun but not very productive because they're doing lots of really neat science but nobody's using it, and when the team really feels like they have superpowers. And there's a bunch of kind of you know, necessary conditions for that. Um, a big part of what makes us successful with data is democratizing access, education, and the distribution of insights. These are a bunch of articles I've written about these kind of team and organizational topics. Uh, so uh, that can be future reading if you're really interested about this stuff. Uh, I'll leave you with this. If everything seems under control, you're not going fast enough. Uh, if anything summarizes my experience in startups and my experience at Instacart, it's this. Uh, it's okay. Uh, things are breaking. You don't understand everything. Uh, and you'll figure it out tomorrow. So that's Great. it. Thanks, Jeremy. So we've, we've been talking about how there's the language of data science and the language of business, and typically the data scientists don't have the domain expertise. Yeah. 
you are clearly the exception. Oh, well, thank and you. So, you know, this is the kind of data scientist that you want, although I don't think there's too many like you out there. So, oh. so thanks for coming in. Yeah, no, you. thank you. I really enjoy it. We'll yeah. Follow on for you, although, thank you know, you. I'm sure you'd rather just have it delivered to your doorstep. <laughs> <laughs>